well, due to demand of everything old, and people wanted to see that black and white GE monitor that went with the Sony or GE uh, half-inch reel-to-reel recorder. We had a linearity problem on that, and the picture's a bit crooked, so I figured, okay, before putting it back into storage, we'll take this one apart, take a look at it, see if we can improve the picture without putting any parts into it. Today we're going to look at this little 1965 black and white TV that needs some adjustments. This was part of that uh, that reel-to-reel videotape recorder um, package. This was actually the tuner for it to tune in programming to record and of course display the tapes on playback. Has a bit of a linearity problem. So we're going to take this one apart and show you guys what it looks like inside and see if we can get this thing looking like it's supposed to look. All televisions of this vintage just had a VHF input with just two screws that you connected twin lead to. If you needed to use coaxial cable, you had to use one of these 75 to 300 ohm balins. And of course it had a built-in antenna as well that you could receive off-air programming with. And they also featured an interlock so that when the back was removed, power was removed from the set. Just held together by standard Phillips screws. So let's remove the screws, and get the back off this one. So unusual on this set is it has both a combination of Phillips and quarter inch hex bolts. Which is kind of unusual. Normally you found the, the quarter inch hex bolts were usually on domestic products like RCA and GE and Zenith and stuff and uh, Japanese used Phillips screws. The fact that this has both types is kind of unusual. All the screws now removed. we have got to take off this as well. The back cover should just lift off. Oh, one more screw. One more screw there. Now the back cover should just lift off, which it does, revealing a circuit board, CRT, high voltage components. Well, this is something I did not expect. This picture tube looks like it has been replaced. Look at this, the sticker has been replaced on it. And the tube manufacture date is November 1968. What I find interesting on this is this is a GE tube, obviously. It says GE electron tube, electronic tube. The number is a 12BZP4. And it was made in Canada by the Canadian General Electric Company. It says the warranty is this tube for 12 months. So I don't believe this was the original tube because that VCR, that VTR, um, they were in 1965 was when that set, where that VTR was produced. But obviously this tube was manufactured November 68, so maybe a replacement tube. And that might explain why there was one quarter inch, where is it here? One quarter inch bolt and the rest of them are Phillips. Maybe the person, also some of the other screws are different color, right? Some of the screws are brown and the others were silver. Maybe the, the uh, servicer that serviced this uh, and changed the CRT put different screws on it. You notice there's a neon lamp here. This is a, 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 a poor man's spark gap. If the voltage between these two uh, pins gets to be over about uh, 60 volts, this neon lamp is going to conduct. And it may not be neon, it might be argon, or it might be some other material, but this is a spark gap. This is a, uh, to, to, which will arc over if the voltage gets too high. Protect the pitch tube. One thing I've noticed on this set here is there's no protective cap for the high voltage. So right there, I'm using an insulated screwdriver by the way, but there'd be 10,000 volts on this button when this set is operating. And this high voltage, uh, this looks, like, this looks to be the diode, looks like uh, it's been uh, wrapped up with electrical tape. So maybe this has been changed before too, I don't know. That looks to be original, but uh, anyway, lots of old caps. I'm not gonna change any caps in the thing. I just wanted the guys to see the inside of it. And we're, we'll just make some adjustments to the the vertical height and the vertical linearity. Uh, chances are these caps here should actually be changed, but this is not a set that is going to be going in, in, into service. So I'm not gonna bother changing them. I just kind of clean up the, the tuner and I don't even have the right type of tuner cleaner to clean this up. Um, but uh, um, 
I don't want to use neutral or deoxid because they've got oil. I could use the deoxid D100 maybe because it doesn't have an oil base to it, I don't think. Um, normally we use the tuner cleaner like uh, Tunnel Power or Tunnel Wash which was made by a company called, um, what was it called, Chem Chemtronics I believe, which did not have an oil base to it because the problem with the oil based tuners is when you put them into these, these mechanical tuners they tend to detune them so you don't want to spray oil based cleaners into these mechanical tuners if you want the tuner to work anyway. But anyway, this is the this is the guts to this thing. Big capacitor here. Some more some more caps over here. Not a heck of a lot to do on this unit because it is functional. Just checking out the vertical and the uh, and the vertical uh, linearity and vertical height controls on this one. And if we look at this, this plug back here, this almost looks like a dual voltage type of cord. This one here is, uh, it's got four pins on it. But on the back of this set, it says that it can operate on 120 volts or 12 volts. Looking at this cord, it's actually not a, uh, on this one, it's not a cutout. It's not an interlock cord because it's not tied to the back, this was actually just a power cord because this set could have a 12 volt cord plugged in as well. So this is the 120 volt cord. I'll power this thing up and electrocute myself. Actually, probably not a smart thing to say with this high voltage that's exposed on this thing. That could be easy. Let's hook up the antenna. Power's off by the way now. We'll hook up the antenna wire and I'll hook up a, a coax to it. And we'll take a look at the picture and see whether I can improve the picture. And try and get a, a full size screen without changing any parts. Because I certainly could change these caps here. I'm sure that they're probably, they are probably bad. So as you can see, the picture is actually crooked, probably because the yoke was never put on straight when the picture tube was replaced, and seeing that the labels peeled off this tube, I can pretty much assure you that that tube was replaced at some point. We're going to straighten that out, but I want to get the linearity uh, correct on this thing, just because it uh, it's not good, and I think it could probably be adjusted. Um, I'm going to clean those controls because the linearity controls are very dirty in the size control. So we're going to give them a shot of cleaner first. I'm going to turn the power off before I do that, just because I'm working right in the vicinity of the flyback transformer. So I'm going to shut off the power. We're going to give these three controls here a bit of clean, and uh, then we'll try adjusting it and see if I can straighten up this. Oh yeah, look at that, the yoke is loose. <laughs> I would explain why it's, uh, I would explain why it's not even clamped on. I think it probably was glued at one point or, or something or they just didn't put the clamp on it. Hmm. Anyway, that, that would explain why the picture's kind of crooked. We'll be able to straighten the picture up on this thing. Let me clean these controls first. We'll use some neutral. hold control and clean that up first okay vertical height and linearity I'm keeping one hand away from the TV not touching anything I just I'm working on it with just one hand I'll just zoom the camera back a bit so you guys can see what I'm doing so I'm just very carefully adjusting the height and the linearity controls back here
that's looking a little bit better. That's the height. And here's the, here's the linearity. There's the linearity. And this one here is the height. There, that's actually not looking too bad now. I'll show you guys what the picture looks like now. Got a full picture, top to bottom. I'm gonna adjust the yoke a bit to make it straight. And I'm gonna put a piece of tape on there to hold it in place. I've gotta power it off. We'll stick some tape on that yoke just so that it doesn't move some foam tape. I'm sure I've got some foam tape I can put on there that will hold the yoke in place. Or even some tape around the back here. This definitely looks like a different picture tube because the the yoke itself isn't even going right up against the bell of the tube which normally they would so I think this is a little shallower tube that was put in this one. Somebody subbed this tube. But it works. It gets the job done. It displays a picture. Let's just see this one's a this one's a Canadian tube. I wonder where the unit was made. Was it made in Japan or was it so we can see where it, if it says where it was made. Also some of you might wonder why when you see me working on electronics I always hold my hand up like this. Right? I'll hold my fingers out like that whenever I'm working around electronics. You'll, you'll never see me, don't you normally not see me working like that with my hand and my fingers in because uh, I want to try and create as much clearance or much space between my hand and anything that could be energized. So quite often when you see me work on something, it's just out of habit. I'll work with it with my hand out of the way like that. Keep my, keep my fingers that uh, I'm not actually making an adjustment with well away from any potential, any touch potential. So that's quite often, you'll see me working on something, I'll be undoing a screw or something and I'll have my hand like this. I'll be doing it because I want to, it, it just, it's just out of habit from working around high voltage that you want to try and keep as much clearance for many of your digits of anything that could be energized because it, cause, cause there's a high voltage pulse on all these, all these, all, this sets on now, right? So you can see there's a picture on here. It sets on. So there's, there's a potential on all of these connections, especially over on this side, over here by the high voltage, which, um, by the way, I'm several inches away. I'm not gonna anywhere near getting a jolt from this thing, but whenever I work on anything, I always, besides the fact that I've got everything isolated on an isolation transformer, and I keep my other hand, I keep it in my pocket or at my side or someplace where there's no possibility of me getting a touch potential from one, you know, to ground and touching something else. I always keep one hand away and I've got insulated uh, footwear on now. So, um, and I'm sitting on an insulated uh, chair. But, um, yeah, it's all it's safety first, safety first. I'm thinking maybe I'll throw some, uh, maybe I'll be able to throw some hot glue on here or something just to keep this thing from rotating. Hot glue right around the neck here. Center this thing, just, just to stop it from moving. We'll put some hot glue on there, that'll stop it from moving. And uh, then I can, uh, put this one together to so say there's there's not a heck of a lot to do on this unit here because it's not really a lot wrong with it the picture is fine uh, it's now straight and it's now full screen as you can see it's full screen tuner could maybe be cleaned a bit but you know really it's not in bad shape really it's you know it's, it's looking pretty good oh that's still not quite straight good thing I checked that get my there we go. Headline news. You know, the, uh, so the, the tuner switch actually isn't in bad shape. And for a TV as old as this, it's actually got a very good picture. Got to clean that control too. Yeah, it's in very good shape for the age of it. So just, let me get my heat, uh, get my uh, hot glue gun heated up. We'll put a bit of hot glue on that yoke just to stop it from moving, and they'll clean the other controls and get this one out of here.
I think this one also has an ion trap. That's what this thing is like a, like a little magnet that is to bend the beam a little bit. Like that's an ion trap on this old set. Anyway, it's it's looking pretty good now. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to put the back on it now, and uh, now at least the yoke won't won't uh, drift quite as easily as it was before. To say this TV is not really going to get used, it's just going to be put back into my collection. It belongs with that reel-to-reel -reel VTR, so we'll uh, leave it at that. The trick to putting these backs on is there's a uh, the circuit board has to slide into a slot on the back here, so. It, to put these together, it's always best to put them together sitting upright as opposed to lying on the their nose. Otherwise, you'll never get the uh, you'll never get the back on correctly. I got to connect these UHF terminals up here, which you pretty much have to do by feel because you got to get your hand in the back. And now the back cover should just slide on if I just carefully. line up the circuit board with the slots in the back. Don't forget to pull the antenna up because it's in the way if you don't. Then the back will slide on, turn it onto its face to do the final assembly here. Like that. As you can see, I was fooled by this plug. I thought it was an interlock because most of the old stuff did. But this one here, it's just got a removable cord because obviously there is a 12 volt cord that's also available that would probably, I'm thinking 12 volts was probably these two outside pins and the 120 was the inside pins, more than likely. But anyway, it's got two, it came with two cords. So this set could be operated in a car. So that would make this one of the early um, sets that could be operated in a vehicle. But anyway, there it is, it's back together. It's got a full picture on it now, and it's not looking too bad. Thanks for watching.